everyone. Thanks so much. I know there's a lot of people coming in and out right now, but um, I just want to say, first of all, that my name's Lorraine Taylor, and I want to thank you all for coming today. I know that there's mimosas, there's uh, Caesar sitting outside, so I truly appreciate that you've actually made your way into this panel presentation today. And I got to say, I'm very excited to be here. Sorry. Um, so you've heard this a few times today already, but if you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to open up the Unite app, select the Q&A module, and of course enter the Unite code and use uh, Track2 for scaling. Submit your question. So again, my name's Lorraine. I lead the partner marketing team here for Shopify. My team looks after finding partners such as yourselves, activating partners, and ultimately supporting partners for, with their needs. Uh, you've probably read a blog post from Anna, who's probably in this audience. P maybe you've gotten an email from George or Joan on my team. Uh, we do a lot of reach out to partners. And I just joined recently, and I got to say this is my first Unite, and I'm very excited to be here. I came from a consumer packaged goods company where I led the global customer relationship management team for brand Enfamil and uh, Record Bank Keezer. So. so we all know that finding customers is a very key part of growing and sustaining any business. So whether that means uh, getting more app installs or just finding new clients, and today what I'm going to do is walk you through a few basic concepts that are going to help you to build out your customer acquisition strategy. So this framework actually may seem very simple to you, but 45% of businesses don't last due to lack of customer focus and no market need. You've all probably um, heard of some businesses who have refrained from following these steps, and I've actually met many businesses who've refrained from following these steps. Well, the ones that have followed them don't have any gaps, and they're very successful. Um, and then during the panel discussion, what we'll do is the, the panel guests will come up and we'll dive deeper into some of the tactics that they've actually used to acquire customers. The concepts I'll cover today are finding your niche, building out your value proposition, profiling and planning the journey of customer, and then ultimately planning for customer to arrive. So the first area is defining your niche or the focus area of your company. What is it you want to offer? What is the unmet need that you're trying to solve for? Try to stay focused on that. Your niche will be critical later as you build out your brand and your customer profile. It will help define who you're selling to, what your business scope is, and ultimately how you build out your value proposition. For example, and I don't think they're here, but shopifypartner.dev, who are based in Australia, they started out as bringing merchants onto the Shopify platform. They slowly determined that their niche was actually in developing apps for other partners to use when building custom themes for their clients. Their product is called Developer Toolkit. This actually helped them to expand and, and into another area, but ultimately stay focused on what they were best at, which was serving their clients' needs. The second area is in determining your value proposition. A clearly articulated value proposition is foundational to customer relationship management. It is the promise that you provide to your customers about why they should hire you. It will position all the benefits that you ultimately need to deliver to your client. And a value proposition will become very important for you to share with your customers and perfect it. So you can either create one from scratch or you can see what the competition has to offer and elbow your way into one that already exists. For example, EtherCycle's not here, they've gone, because I saw I haven't seen him in a while, but his value proposition is um, to help Shopify store owners uncover hidden profits on their website. And they describe it on their website as turn your store into a power into a revenue generating powerhouse of persuasion. This is very strong because it tells their customers what they will do for them, which is turn their store into a revenue generator. This is the value that they're providing to their customers. The next area is in determining your customer profile and the journey that your businesses will take to get to your business. It ensures that all the products that you're offering and services that meet your customers' needs and you will understand how and where to find them. Because hey, did you know that actually 30% of most businesses don't actually think about creating a customer profile before they start to target their audience? That's a staggering number. Some questions that you might want to ask yourself are, where do customers spend their time? What message do you want to get across to them and when? 
and when can you reach your customers. The final step is preparing for guests to arrive. You'll want to think about the different tactics that you want to use to reach your customer at the right time and at the right location. And finally, you'll need to prepare. This is where you want to make sure that your house is all set up to receive your guests. I think this paints the picture nicely. For example, when you land, a customer lands on your website, you want to make sure that your value proposition is clearly, uh, clearly shown um, and you, that your customer knows how to contact you. All too often, the experience that, that you, when you land on a website doesn't match the path that gets you there. So now that I've taken you through these four key principles on how to attract and retain customers, it's very, very important to say that once they join you, you should stay obsessed with serving your customers' needs. You can do this by building the best products, continuously supporting them, and staying connected to your customers' changing needs. An example, again, is a partner of ours, Pearl. Pearl is customer obsessed, and they truly believe in treating their customers like humans and not data points. They then help their customers to get obsessed about their clients. And they recently took their client, Turtle Fur, through Persona and Humanization Training 101. They then built out personalized campaigns and saw an 80% increase in email open rates. So now I'm really excited to actually introduce my guests and panel. It's actually a dream panel, and so I'm, um, I'm happy to uh, get them to share with you their experiences uh, and their tactics on how they grew their customer ba um, bases. Please welcome C, Holly, and Olivia. Hi, everybody. How are you guys? Hi. Good. Great. Good. Yeah. Great. OK, perfect. So what I was hoping is that if you could just start off by just briefly introducing yourself. And if you can think of anything that you've learned maybe over the last couple of days at Unite would be helpful. If not, no worries. Just introduce yourself. We'll start with you, Olivia. Hi, guys. I'm Olivia Gorey from Yapo. Um, Yapo is a full suite user-generated content marketing engine. Uh, something that I've learned over the past few days Justin Trudeau is just as charming in person <laughs> as he is on the television. <laughs> no, not really. Um, for me, I work out of the Tel Aviv, Yapo's Tel Aviv headquarters. So while I interact a lot with our partners, I actually haven't met most of them in person. So this is the first opportunity for me to engage with Shopify folks, our tech partners, our agency partners, and I'm just really wowed at what an incredible group of people this ecosystem is and really excited to be part of it. Hi everyone, my name's Holly and I'm the founder of a company called Pixie. We have two apps in the Shopify app store. We're a SaaS company. We optimize photo content for e-commerce merchants by automatically, it's human powered image editing essentially. We can pull the images from their store, uh, edit them and push them back within 24 hours because platforms, not only do you just want them fixed for your Shopify store, merchants also want their images fixed for Amazon, Google Shopping, House, all these marketplaces that have image requirements. Um, I've loved the parties at Shopify. It's just, I've been to all three nights, and last night was fantastic. It was, yeah. Hi, my name is Zilu. I'm the co-founder of WM Digital. WM stands for Website and Marketing, so we're a website and marketing agency and do all things digital. Um, the last two days, Shopify, I mean, she took my <laughs> Justin Trudeau <laughs> <laughs> experience, so uh, I guess just learning what Shopify is doing uh, what they have new products coming out, what kind of new products, I think that's really amazing. 60% uh, of our customer base use Shopify, so it's really great to be here and learning more about it. It's true, it's really good to understand really a lot about your customers, so maybe if you want to tell me a little bit about um, what's the one thing that you would want this audience to know about how you, um, what we want to know about how, how you found customers. So, um, Starting off, Yapo was founded in 2011, and the sort of the idea from Yapo came after one of our founders, Tomer, had a really negative experience buying a camera online. When he got the camera, he realized that all of these amazing effusive reviews he had read were totally fake. 
So he and our other co-founder, Omri, set out to solve this authenticity problem um, around ratings and reviews. And so initially, like when we sort of were defining our niche and figuring out who our customers were, we took a very customer-centric approach. Um, and also at that time in 2011, there weren't a lot of trusted rating and reviews engines at all. And so not only were we solving this critical um, customer problem, but we were also like a perfect market fit. Um, but again, in 2011, we could have never anticipated that seven years down the line, we would have built this entire user-generated content engine. You know, we started at ratings and reviews and we've evolved over time. So I think that's a really important part of the Yacht Post story is this constant evolution. Yeah. Holly? I think for us, so I started, I was actually building Shopify stores about five, six years ago and the biggest problem was the content that all the stores were giving me and I was like, I can't sell your product if you don't have good content. So initially I started it by reaching out to stores. When once so we had built, like, you could submit orders through our platform, uh, sorry, through our own website, and then we built onto Shopify. And to get Shopify in, like, get people to install our app, we essentially first went on, like, outreaching to customers and really thinking about where in the journey does your product fit. So, for example, I realized that everybody was preparing their catalog for trade shows or for whatever they, like, before holiday season. So I'd reach out then. I wouldn't reach out during the busy season because they were doing other stuff. So really thinking about where you fit in into their user experience or their life cycle. Um, and then I started hanging out on, we built our second app a year ago, and I kept hanging out in the forums, the Shopify forums, and everybody was asking, oh, can you give me feedback on my store? And so I realized that I kept giving the same feedback, and that was, you need to resize all your photos to make sure they sit in line and they look you know, even. And I was like, why can't we just build an app for this? Um, and that's when it, uh, I guess we got, uh, we got featured, which was very, very good because we have thousands of app installs now and it continually grows every day. So I think it's about hanging out in those forums and then also helping the stores. So when you're answering their questions, it's not about saying, hey, here's an app for this. It's about giving feedback and then later on, I mean, a sneaky hack is that actually on your Shopify name, you can put a tag. So you can put, say, like you're the owner or founder of an app so that they're obviously going to be like, who is this person giving me advice? And then they'll look it up and then they, you know, Use your app. <laughs> and so did you find out very pretty quickly what your niche was then, just by just going into the forums and learning? Or did, did it take you a few bumps in the road before you figured it out? Um, I think I've always been interested in the photography side because I think on product pages, like product images are, for me, the most important thing. For our merchants, the most important thing. And then descriptions and everything else that goes with it. Um, and that content's obviously used on Instagram and social media. Um, I think for our second app, it, it really is a niche. And now we have, uh, we have s thousands of users that we can basically go to them and ask them, like, what other feature requests do they want? Or they come to us complaining that we don't have X, Y, and Z. So it allows us to grow from there. Right, definitely. How about you, C? How about you guys finding out your customer? How did you figure out what your niche was? Well, when I first started seven or eight years ago in 2010 on my own, I just left my corporate job that I have worked in marketing and strategy for a very long time. So I wasn't really thinking like what my niche was at the time. I was just like, I knew I like design, technology and business. So what else to, you know, <laughs> to do besides having my own web design agency? Um, so when Papa being in a two years later, I figure like you know if I want to find a niche, I want I'm look I was looking at my our local. I we're based in Miami, so Miami is a very tourism city. So I was thinking where the businesses are right. So we have hotels, restaurants. Uh, we also have a very hot real estate market. So those three targets, like my audience, will be res was restaurant, hotel and real estate at the time. So fast forward last year, I uh, you know, partnered with my new business partner and started this WM Digital Company. And because of our fat passion in fashion and background in retail, so we decided what else to do if you, you know, to follow your passion and do what you love every day. So now we're focusing on uh, high-end retail. Right. Of course, e-commerce also picked up really quickly within the last few years. So, you know, doing helping them with the e-commerce is just uh, no-brainer. 
So that's a really good tie-in to figuring out what your value is because you can understand sometimes who your customers are, but you don't always necessarily understand what the value is that you want to provide to those customers. So do either of you have a good example of maybe what your business's value proposition is if you've thought of it in those terms? I don't know if you have, but... Yeah, so I think similar to Yacht Pro's niche, our value prop has not only evolved over time, but also evolved in tandem with our clients. You know, we started off, we credit a lot of our initial success to Shopify. We were one of the first apps on the App Store. Um, and seven years, 70,000 merchants later, um, we are now working with larger clients as those SMBs grew and moved into, um, into the mid-market realm. So our value prop, has has evolved, but at its core, it's to help companies leverage their customers to build and grow their brands. And a great example of how we've done this with one of our merchants is with Pura Vida. Um, we've been working with them for years, and we've grown our product and the value that we've given to Pura Vida over time. Within the first year of working with us, we helped them generate 25,000 reviews. And then we realized that they could actually be using those reviews in their marketing channels, in Facebook and Instagram. So we developed new products around that. And we've really now you know, helped them leverage the power of social proof to propel their business. And also in those terms, I think it's interesting is that you have a really great way of showing your customer that value because you can actually show them the interactions that their customers are having, right? Is that a great way that you demonstrate that? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And what about you, Holly? Do you have a value prop? I think our you value share? proposition, well, we have two types of customers. We have the customers who already edit their photos with a photographer, with a graphic designer, or they're doing it themselves in-house, so we're saving them time and money. Or we have the other side of customers who have never thought to do it before, so we're increasing their conversion rate because they have better content. Yeah. Um, and I think now, like, it was good that we started in such a niche because we now get feedback from customers where what other features they would like um, and where we can expand. And we're really focusing on the product page and automation of ev all the content you need for your product page. So it allows us to move in and like increase our lifetime value of our customer because we're essentially adding new features or new services uh, onto what we currently do. Right, so you're constantly building on it. So even though you might have started out with one thing that you felt was really valuable to your customers, do you find that like it just continuously adds on and there's more and more value always. that your customers are seeing? Always. Yeah, okay. definitely. I mean, so do you have course. an example of that? It's just, uh, well, I guess I'm not going to talk about it too much. We've definitely surveyed customers and we are okay. looking into uh, something else. Um, okay. But I think the thing is it's about, at the beginning, you do want to start really focused because then people know you for what you do. Right. Um, like everybody knows Pixie for photos, for photo optimization, um, and it allows you to expand and allows you to be really good at what you do. I think that's the one thing that's been really useful is our second app. You know, we have over 900 reviews, some of those weird ones that are one reviews because somebody can't figure something out, or we don't have a feature on it yet that they would like, so they say it doesn't work. Um, but it's really allowed us to get all those leads, get that growth, rather than try and be everything to everyone. Yeah. Um, and then speak to our customers. I've started hanging out with our customers a lot more, going for yeah. physical coffees, because in this digital oh. world, nobody meets up with their customers. I don't think I've ever met any of our SaaS, mm -hmm. like there's my SaaS suppliers that I use, I don't think I've ever met any of them. Oh, wow, okay. Um, oh, I've met Shopify, but we're not, yeah. I mean, we're a partner. Yeah. Um, but if you think about like our chat tools and our email marketing tools. Yep. So that's but you're heavily digital-based company, so that yeah, makes a lot yeah. of sense for sure. What exactly. about you, C? Is that the same experience you've had? Do you do you get out and meet your clients? I mean, probably in your world, well, it's a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Our value proposition is we truly understand our clients. I mean, that okay. sounds like a cliche, but we have our retail background and also very uh, deep knowledge of business. Um, so when we work with our retail clients, we already know what they're going through, how they get their clients in the store, how they um, take care of them when they walk in the store. So. We want to bring that experience, same experience online. Okay. So since we're so familiar with the process, so I'll give you an example. We just launched a uh, shop called Alchemist. It's, if you go to shopalchemist.com, it's a very avant-garde uh, clothing store, high-end streetwear. They sell uh, oversized hoodie for like $700, $800. And what we, uh, if you go to, if you get to go to the store in Miami, is a very nice high ceiling. You walk in, you feel like, wow, you really, you feel like you're very trendy already. <laughs> so how are we gonna bring that on the website? So if you go on their website, shop, 
alchemist.com, you see what we changed the, the profile icon, you know, that comes with Shopify and cart, we changed it into a skull. And when you hover over it, the skull will, will wink at you. Okay. So we did add all this animation. Like instead of a cart, we use a shopping bag. And when you hover over the shopping bag, it will smile at you. Mm. So we all add all these little elements to bring that experience truly online. And our retailers love it because, you know, and anybody can build a website, Definitely. truthfully. So. Yeah. And that's a really great lead in. And I mean, any of you can answer this, but one of the things I talked about was just making sure that when your customers land on your website, and it's, I guess it's the same for your clients, that they, um, that, that, you know, the path that got them there was the one that, that, so they don't land there and think, I don't know why I landed on this website. This, this website's not for me. So right. Can you guys share examples of how maybe you set up your businesses so that when your guests arrive or your customers arrive, you're ready and prepared? Sure. So we tailor our uh, landing page to, you know, where the customer came from in their journey. So, for example, if they found us on the Shopify App Store, we have a Shopify App Store specific landing page for them. Okay. They found us in the Shopify Plus directory. We have a Shopify Plus specific landing page. They found us from a Yachtpo widget on one of our merchant sites. We have a landing page tailored to that. So it's a very much tailored to the journey of the customer. And we have, you know, a 30-person marketing team constantly A-B testing and optimizing to figure out which landing pages convert the most. And yeah. we're optimizing these on like a near weekly basis. Yeah, definitely. How about you? I would love to be doing what you guys are doing. <laughs> <laughs> we actually we have, have a just huge started yeah. um, with lead pages. So you can build out. It, it, what's been really good is we have a very small engineering team. And so using something like lead pages is we've been able to build out landing pages quickly um, with different content. So depending exactly like where they come from or just testing things for ads or we use, we actually use our Shopify app listing page heavily because that's where most of our leads go. Or if we lead people, we want it to be Shopify specific for the app. So then we'll lead them to that page. Okay. And then once they land on your website, though, like how do you get them in to understand more about your business and what you offer? We do offer you? a free trial. So free it's not, okay. we, you can That's submit cool. an image. If you install our Shopify app, you get five free images edited. So because we, we're lucky in that way, our app is so simple, we can get people to convert within 24 hours or say 48. Because what they'll do is they'll submit a trial and then they'll get their image back and then they, we, they get a follow up email if they don't open their image. And then within, well, you know, the next 24 hours, they've decided if they want it or not. Okay. Um, so it's not really, it's not an app where they need to go and use it and set up this system and that system and, you know, make sure it works. And I have no idea about that model and I feel for those people. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can offer a free trial or something like a small slice, um, that can help. I think the other thing is what we did, and I know that Shopify spoke about this uh, yesterday, that they don't, they actually want you to build one app and have, you know, you can list your app in multiple places now. But what really helped us before, a year ago, we actually split our apps. So we didn't build the new feature into our existing app. We built it as a new app and we made it free. Um, and then that allows us to collect leads, sell to people, and then upsell any other services on a new app. Okay. So, sense. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure which way Shopify is going to go, but yeah. it's been helpful for us to split the apps. Oh, that's good. Those are some really good examples of some tactics that you've used for sure. I like the idea of offering free. It gives a kind of a trial of your offering and then they just can buy into yeah. it afterwards. That makes sense. it's really important to help yeah. the customers just when you're onboarding them. Um, and it, that human touch, like even if it's a customer success team, you do obviously need to calculate how much it's going to cost you, but that's when the person has that problem. And if you reach out to them a week or two later, especially with us, they're like, sorry, I needed my catalog a week ago. Like, it's too late. Yeah, yeah, real time, makes total yeah. sense. Yeah. What about, do you have any examples, see, of any of the tactics you might have used in the beginning to try to bring, to find new customers? Well, first to, uh, back to your question about sure. validating when the, when somebody lands to your website yeah. on our wm.digital website. If you go over there, on our homepage, there are two sections, very simple. The first part is our animated logo. So our logo is the WM overlap each other. So on your mobile, you click on the M, it will show you a very nice animation, and then the, at the bottom, we say websites and what we do for websites. Okay. And then if you hover over or click on your mobile on W, it will, M will say marketing and tell you what to do. Okay. And then underneath it, instead of like using stock photos and paragraphs and what we do, we have a very, inter very cute interactive city where you mm -hmm. can click 
you know, you see a city, we have like boats moving, car going across, and then if you, and then we show all different services using a cloud for hosting, and then we have a building that's at e-commerce. So if you click that, it will take you to that page. So we want to show our customer the experience right away. So some very, you got some really engaging content that very keeps your engaging. customers on there. Yes. Keeps them staying on your website. Absolutely. For sure. Yep. Excellent. Um, and what about, because see, you were telling me too, when we were having our conversations before, just when we first met each other, I thought it was a really interesting story you told me about. Uh -oh. Sometimes it's difficult. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> that, how it's like not always easy to find clients that are customers that fit with you, like then your business. And I found that really interesting that you might sometimes even turn them away. So how do you yes, we figure that out? Do. I mean, in, in, uh, in, um, you know, nice world, I guess. We will take all the customers, but in reality, it, that is not the case. I know in the beginning, it's probably hard to turn down customer. You just want to have as many as you want, but after a while, you realize that, you know, like we find, you find your niche, so you realize that some of the customers are just not a right fit. So what we do, usually when we get a lead, either from Shopify or online or referral, we usually start with a phone call. Okay, just to kind of get a feel of what they're looking for, if they, you know, because we have like certain, like two small jobs who probably not a right fit for us. So, and then we'll also send them a questionnaire after the phone call. It's a five to 10 minutes questionnaires that they filled out and then we have a lot more information and we can go from there. Right. So that's very important and we realize that we're taking a lot more time in the beginning. It's not just about sign, sign, sign. For sure. It's about, you know, exact, understand exactly what your customer is looking for and what you're getting yourself into before you take them on as a customer. I think it's a win-win for both. Definitely. Yeah. So. What about you guys? Do you have any examples of anything like similar to that where you've just had to maybe potentially it just wasn't the right fit for your business or? Yeah, so we take a really personalized approach to finding the right package for um, our merchants. We work with SMBs, like I said, we built our company on the back of Shopify SMBs. We also work with really massive, like more mid-market enterprise merchants, and they work with our sales team to figure out exactly the, pr the precise combination of products that'll work to help grow their business. We know that not everyone is gonna need, you know, our entire suite of products. Um, and something we recently launched, even though we are moving more up market, SMBs are still a really core part of our business. And we were getting feedback from them that the Yapo product was just too expensive for them. So what we did was we rolled out specifically for Shopify SMBs a $29 a month plan. And we are constantly evolving and iterating on those pricing plans as well to make sure that like we're catering to as much of the market as possible. Okay. And Holly, you and I spoke about a bunch about that too when we had our conversation early on. Was like one of the things that you said to me kept you up at night was about pricing. pricing. Yeah. So yeah, maybe you can I think explain that. As a as a startup, so like aside from Shopify, when I first started as a startup, no one really talks to you about. They say that you need to price test, but no one sits you down and says, okay these are the features that you have and let's value them. And we only ever really valued our service. Um, so I think around the pricing and back around the to the customers is that, you know, I don't want to say this in the room necessarily, <laughs> but I want to help all the other founders out there, yeah. is that okay. sometimes you need to get rid of some customers. Um, you know, we have some customers who, our best customers never contact customer service. Maybe once, they have no problem, they fix it. Whereas you have other people who like submit one image and that image goes around and around and around and they use us as a graphic design service. And we're just, they're just not appropriate for us. And I'm more than happy to help them and say like, hey, you should use graphic design service or a freelancer or Fiverr, um, but that's not suitable for us. And I think it's at our stage and at the beginning you want all the customers but after a while, you have to realize that they're actually, they're, you're losing money on them. Like we lose money because customers, our customer success team spends so much time working with them. Right, makes sense. So we only have a few minutes left before we're gonna break into questions, but I wanna ask you all if you give me one example of maybe one surprise tactic that you might have tried that worked for you and maybe one failed tactic that didn't work so well, so. So I think one surprise tactic that has worked really well for us is content. Um, we started churning out a lot of compelling thought leadership 
and thought leadership that was partner agnostic. So we weren't trying to sell Yachtco in these think pieces. You know, we were giving like the 10 commandments of UGC. We were really just creating content to help propel the merchant. And we were surprised by, you know, uh, the inbound rates that came from uh, that content. And we actually now have like a five person content team specifically focused on churning out uh, a bunch of different compelling content. And in terms of a tactic that hasn't worked, um, paid acquisition for us, yeah, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it's been really, really hard it's for tough. us to scale that efficiently, it's tough. right? And yeah. to, find, to find a large enough target audience with intent. Yeah. And I think for us initially, when we were just focused on SMBs, paid acquisition did work pretty well, and the ROI was there. But now as we're moving more up market, it's, it's not working, and I think recognizing that you know you can't just copy and paste one acquisition tactic for SMBs and use no. it for mid-market, so yeah. we're, we're learning as we go. Very true, yeah. I think for us, I mean, it's been a couple of things, definitely splitting the app, building, building a very, very, very basic feature. Um, it was initially built just as the lead generator. It was built for, like we built it for free. Um, we also do a lot of content. I think we do a lot of partner content. You know, these Shopify Unite is fantastic for that. And it's not about saying, oh, let's just write a piece of content for the sake of writing content. Again, it's like, okay, can I partner with somebody who has a, um, you know, a multi-channel app that for Amazon users? Okay, app, those users are going to need photos that comply with Amazon. So then writing that content. So again, coming back to the user journey. Um, the thing that hasn't worked for us is paid advertising. I, I kind of believe, well, this is my assumption, or well, I'm definitely not an expert and we have no one in the team, so if anyone has figured it out, I'd love to speak to you. But I think the thing is it's actually about, for us, these merchants aren't busy on Facebook looking for a solution. They're busy on Facebook serving their end user. So they're not interested in... Um, in you know talking to us the one thing that does has worked a bit but it's very manual and you could do it at the beginning is direct message in Instagram because the person who's running Instagram usually they're the marketing person um, and nobody uses direct message like it's I true. rarely ever get direct it's messages true. in Instagram yeah. so we did a hack where we wrote like we would have photos we'd have a a fashion photo, a furniture photo, and let's say like a sports equipment photo. And if you were a fashion company, we would write and be like, hey, we're just curious, how do you edit your photos currently? We'd love to help you. And we would send it before or after example. The other yeah. thing that actually did work yeah. was scraped sites and we would edit oh, a photo, yeah. send them a photo and be like, this is what you could have. Oh, Are you interested? Yeah, Again, like we had processes, it wasn't, it was a little bit manual. You need to do these things that don't scale at the beginning to see what works. There's no point building a full system. Yeah. Um, but they're the little like hack things that we did. Very good. Well, for us is when we first had, our, well, the first version of our website is not as animated and interactive as we, I was just, you know, mentioned. And it was more, we were trying to put too many things on the homepage. You know, it was when we were, um, new agency, you wanted everybody to know what you do. So we kind of, you know, made not a mistake, we always, you know, learn, it's a learning lesson. Um, so once we refine our homepage, the leads that come online are more valid, are more qualified. So right. that is something that we learned. It's funny because, well, you do web design, yeah, it's easier <laughs> to do it for somebody else than sure. do it for yourself. Sure. Uh, one tactic that really works for us in terms of getting clients is to partner with uh, local agencies. Mm -hmm. When, I'm, when I mean local agencies, for example, we have a partnership with a social media company. So we're not competitor, but their clients will always will also need website, and our clients will also need social media service. So we refer each other business, and also with a, and a branding agency, they do a lot of design, logo, and but they don't do any development. They don't do any web development. Again, you know, create that partnership. Don't be intimidated just because they are another agency. You know, we're very open about that, and we have this network, also photographers. You know, our clients need photographers for their e-commerce products. Mm -hmm. So we have this network, and so when the clients come to us and, oh, do you know somebody who can do a social media or photographer? We already know. We already know who's the best in town. Right. So that's always help, you know, with the, for the clients and also getting business. It's interesting, because you actually have to know your customers to find your customers, but you also have to understand your clients' customers. So Correct. you have to, yeah, exactly. it's, it adds a little important. bit of complexity for sure. Yes. Yeah. 
Cool. Okay, so we're supposed to ask, uh, do some Q&A now from the audience. So, okay, perfect. I'm gonna just stick this down here. Okay. Glasses on, one second, because I can't see anything in the dark. Okay. Uh, okay, so any of you, any, any of you ladies wanna answer any of these questions? Um, Okay, how do you handle dealing with clients who have such different creative view than you, especially if you want to protect your reputation and your content? Interesting. That's a great one. Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, we get that sometimes, that our clients has a different aesthetics than we do. I guess, you know, go back to communication is very important. Uh, explain the reasoning behind why your design looks this way and what is, you know, the benefit to the clients, because sometimes clients, they think they know more than you do. I mean, maybe from the business perspective, they do. But from a design and development, you have to stand your ground and tell them, we've been doing this for a very long time. We understand where you're coming from, but this is from our experience, taking the best practices from other clients. This is what we think is best for you. And sometimes it might just be you know, coming to a happy medium. Yep, so definitely. Yeah. Uh, OK, Holly, this is for you. Mm -hmm. um, how did you go about getting over 900 reviews? How often do you ask your customers to rate your app? I always ask customers for feedback. I think it's really important. Um, so any opportunity to ask customers for feedback, whether it's positive or negative, I think is really, really good. Okay. Cool. Cool. So just ask. I think that's what we've done. Really. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, sorry. Now I'm just going to hear. All right. So. Um, and I guess for both of you guys, you two, on the end is Holly and um, Olivia. How did you handle the first release of your app? You guys remember? First release? Release, yeah. Well, at the beginning, no one knows yeah. it, so <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe it doesn't really matter. Right there. There. <laughs> but actually, we, I guess, again, because we were a service, you could actually submit photos through our site. Like, we have a, you have an account on our site. Um, we would find out another hack, use built with, find out which stores um, are on Shopify, so you could already get the customer, like take your customer list, see who's on Shopify. Then I would say, okay, we've released our app. If you install it, you'll get five free images. Um, and then that's how we handled, is that what, I don't know, I don't know. if that's what tell. they mean by yeah. first release. Yeah, for us, I'm not I mean, sure. I wasn't there in 2011. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we had a really, really close customer feedback loop very early on. We, when we started, did not have any customer success managers. And our founders, who are Israeli, took a uniquely Israeli approach to getting feedback on the first few iterations of our app. In that, if you've ever met Israelis, they're incredibly direct. So they literally picked up the phone, got on the phone with the merchants, and asked them point blank what is working, what's not, and really like drilled home, like dug into all of the little nuances of what was and wasn't working um, in the first okay. couple of iterations to oh, make okay. it better. That's good. Here's a good question too is, which customer acquisition channel is your number one in terms of the amount of customers and of ROI, if you know? Geez, tough one, huh? Yeah. Very tough. Yeah. Um, I think one. some things you, some, I don't have the exact answer, but I think there's some things that is, are very hard to measure. So for example, being part of Facebook groups, how do you measure that? Being part right. of the forums, how do you measure it? Right. Um, it's one of the toughest things to do. Yeah, is like to measure how do you attribution measure of ROI all those of content, which yeah. actually it's not necessarily the content. Like I had a customer the other day, and they're like, "Oh, we saw a piece about you, so we actually switched from somebody else we were using to you guys." Okay. And so I think they're like, "Yeah, you're more expensive than this, but we really liked the piece of content that you did with the partner." So I think it, like that stuff, you c it's very hard to measure. Yeah. Um, I mean, Definitely. obviously, there's paid ads, which we yeah. don't do. I think for so. us, again, it's, I couldn't tell you which channel specifically, but I think a lot of our most quality leads actually come from our partner ecosystem. Um, we partner with over 150 different Shopify agencies, and we have integrations with over 20 different tech partners. So like my best advice to apps out there is to really take advantage of this incredibly robust, powerful ecosystem. We have really awesome partnerships with so many people, and we get these incredible uh, lead sources from them. So I guess a follow-on question to that too then, oh. Olivia, on here is, how do, um, what are your advice for app developers to grow up market? Because there's a couple of questions on here about growing up market or to serve Shopify Plus as well. So yeah, I think I it's, it's to, to really 
listen to your merchants. Again, we grew with our merchants. So Pura Vida, Movement Watches, they started out small. We were constantly learning from them, like what type of products did they need to help sell their um, to sell their goods. Like for example, we never had like a visual suite of products. And then with the advent of Instagram, Pura Vida and Movement were like, we really need visual suite of products. And so that drove us in, um, in sort of a different product direction that has helped align us with more, up, more, more upmarket clients. Okay. Uh, we probably have time for one last question. This one's from Jesse Myers. Uh, how do you handle raising prices on existing long-term clients who started out with you at a much ro lower rate than what is currently sustainable? I have that exact problem. Okay. Um, yeah. I've done, there's this fantastic blog called Price Intelligently. They're a SaaS company just for pricing. Uh, they're very expensive, we don't use them. They're upwards of 100 grand. Um, but they have a lot of content. So they do say don't grandfather customers forever. Toby disagrees. Apparently his grandfathered Shopify Plus users at $29 in 2008. Um, but I definitely think that you do need to, customers will understand because they are business owners, right. well for apps, that we're selling to merchants, that the price is going to, like prices change, um, costs change every year. So I think it's just about giving them uh, the time. The other thing is if you launch any new features, they can stay grandfathered, but they do not get access to anything new. If they want the new features, they upgrade to the new price. Right. Good. I think that's great. Thanks, thanks very much. We're out of time, but that was a great way of closing just to say that your customers are going to change a lot. So thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, if anybody has any questions, please come and up and see us afterwards and we'd be happy to answer your questions.